So um, we're going to finish up on retinal vascular diseases, not including diabetes. So um, most of you guys were here last time, so we covered venous and arterial occlusions last time. And this time we have a lot of kind of smaller topics to cover and we'll try and get through them um, as much as we can. But we'll start with ocular ischemic syndrome. Hi, good morning. So um, severe carotid occlusions can lead to reduction in the blood flow and this reduction in the blood flow from the carotid system leads to both anterior and posterior segment ischemia. Um, most common complaint is vision loss. This is gradually progressive over weeks to even months. A fair number of patients will come in complaining of pain. And this is um, typically an ischemic type pain, so the pain gets better when they lay down just because they're lowering their perfusion pressure and they're able to perfuse the eye when they're laying down. Uh, the pain can also be inflammatory for anterior segment um, inflammation, or the pain can be from <coughs> elevated intraocular pressure because they can come in with neovascular glaucoma as well. We often see this in older men, and it can be bilateral. It's pretty rare, um, but it is thought that this could be underestimated because it can also mimic mild to moderate NPDR or a mild non-ischemic CRVO, so perhaps we're not calling it as often as it really is. So just to <coughs> refresh the anatomy, so um, the ophthalmic artery gives rise to the central retinal, is that a pointer? Oh yeah, central retinal artery, and then the posterior ciliary arteries, and those <coughs> both arise from the internal carotid. So if you have an occlusion at the internal carotid, you're gonna get a reduction of the blood flow that provides blood to both the anterior and the posterior seg segments, as well as the retinal and choroidal circulation. So that's how we end up with more widespread ischemia and they're perfusing from usually collateral circulation that's arising from the circle of Willis. So the uh, findings on clinical exam, they um, often come in with unexplained neovascular glaucoma or rubiosis. They can have spontaneous hyphemas, <coughs> anterior chamber inflammation. They can have more of a cataract on this side of the eye with the occlusion. <coughs> and they can also have synechia, iris atrophy, on retinal exam, you can find um, vitreous hemorrhages, peripheral neovascularization. The most common thing we see clinically would be mid-peripheral blot hemorrhages, but they can also have optic nerve changes with pallor and edema or even macular edema. Um, they often will have pretty severe stenosis of that carotid artery on that same side, and this can be the uh, presenting uh, findings for carotid occlusive disease in a pretty high number of patients. Um, you know, I think this is important to keep in mind over at the VA where we have our kind of vasculopathic population because they often are associated with um, ischemic heart disease, prior TIAs, peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and they do have a higher stroke rate, 4% uh, stroke rate per year compared to just half a percent in control population, which is age matched. Um, this is the retinal findings that you'll see, which is these kind of mid peripheral blot hemorrhages. These are deeper blot hemorrhages as opposed to the kind of fl more flame hemorrhages that you would see in a vein occlusion. Um, in clinic, when you're kind of looking at these patients and you're not sure, is this diabetic? Is it a vein occlusion? Is it uh, ocular ischemic syndrome, one thing you can do pretty easily is ophthalmodynomimometry. And so what you're doing is basically just putting gentle pressure on the globe. So while I'm looking with the indirect, I could, you just put pressure on the globe and you're looking for cessation of the, um, well, you'll start causing arterial pulsations and you shouldn't be able to do that in a normal eye. Um, but with these eyes with poor perfusion, you can overcome that ophthalmic artery perfusion pressure just with gentle globe digital pressure. Does that make sense, how, how I would do that? So you would just kind of have your indirect kind of gently press on, on your finger, tell the patient you're going to press, and then you'll, you can overcome the central retinal artery and start to see pulsations, then that could be an indication of reduced blood flow and reduced perfusion pressure to the uh, central retinal artery. 
Um, the other clinical finding is to do a floor CD angiogram. The most common thing you'll see would be prolongation of the AV transit. That's the most sensitive, but the most specific sign would be delay in the choroidal filling. So normal choroidal filling should happen within five seconds of the dye being pushed. Um, but in ocular ischemic syndrome, it can take quite a bit longer, even up to a minute. You can also see retinal vascular staining, and this is typically staining of the arteries. And then you can also have angiographic le leakage into the macula as well. So um, this just shows the delay in the choroidal filling. You can see even at 24 seconds that the choroid isn't completely filled. And then there's pretty significant delay in the AV transit time up to 49 seconds. We still don't have these um, veins filled out here. The other thing you can see is staining of the arterial walls in the periphery. Oh, yeah. Do you also get capillary dropout? You can get capillary dropout. You can also see um, microaneurysms as well. Um, I think this is a a really good chart. This came from like a review article of ocular ischemic syndrome and this just contrasts the different clinical findings between ocular ischemic syndrome, vein occlusions, and diabetic retinopathy. And your really severe ischemic CRVO, you're not going to mix that up with ocular ischemic syndrome, but it's more those kind of mild non-ischemic ones where you'll be like, oh, I don't know, which could it be? One thing to look at would be the retinal veins. So in an ocular ischemic syndrome, they're dilated, but they're not going to be tortuous. Whereas in a vein occlusion, they should be tortuous. Diabetic retinopathy, you'll see more beating rather than uh, tortuosity. Um, and then, yeah, this lead just answers your question, capillary dropout in the, in the ocular ischemic syndrome, which you can also see in vein occlusion and diabetic retinopathy. Um, but you really won't see exudates, hard exudates in, di in uh, ocular ischemic syndrome like you would see in diabetes. And then um, central retinal perfusion pressure, that would be normal in vein occlusion and diabetic retinopathy. And then this, uh, the angiographic finding of that de delayed choroidal filling. In uh, CRVO, you'd see vessels, vein, staining as opposed to arterial staining that you would see in ocular ischemic syndrome. So I think those are the biggest things that can help you kind of figure out the difference. Obviously, um, if you're not sure, you know, doing the test to rule out ocular ischemic syndrome is a pretty non-invasive, safe test and pretty low risk. So if you're really not sure, I think getting a carotid Doppler and just ruling it out is not going to, no one's going to fault you for that if you're worried. So the, um, to diagnose getting the carotid Doppler, if that's uh, questionable, then go into a CT angiogram. A carotid angiogram is always considered the gold standard, but it's not really done because of the uh, high uh, morbidity associated with it. They have a pretty high risk of um, strokes and TIAs associated with that carotid angiogram, so it's not really our, the standard first line test. Um, the prognosis um, really isn't that great. If they have rubiosis, 90% will be legally blind within one year. So it's a pretty high rate of visual loss. You can get rid of the neovascularization about 35% of the time with PRP. You can also use anti-VEGF agents for these patients to help control the pressure. And they do have a pretty high five-year mortality rate due to a cardiovascular disease is the most common problem. So as far as the treatments for the eye, um, controlling inflammation and um, with steroids and cycloplegics that can help with the, the pain and the inflammation and managing the intraocular pressure. A lot of these patients end up with either shunting procedures from the glaucoma uh, service or even diode uh, cyclophotocoagulation. From the retina standpoint, we can control the neovascularization with anti-VEGFs and PRP. But the main thing is also getting them to the vascular surgeon for a carotid endarterectomy. Any questions about ocular ischemic syndrome? No? Okay. So we'll move on to hypertensive retinopathy. So um, 
really most patients with hypertensive retinopathy, when they're coming in with kind of mild to moderate hypertension, they might not have any visual complaints at all, and the most common thing you'll see would be AV nicking. There's really not any association between what the blood pressure is and the retinal findings. Patients that come in with vision loss, those are our patients that come in with malignant hypertension, really severe accelerated hypertension that you see with like eclampsic, our eclampsic patients or um, renal hypertension. So the uh, modified shade classification, uh, grade zero really have no changes. Uh, grade one, arterial narrowing. Grade two, narrowing with irregularities in the arteries. And then in grade three is when you'll see hemorrhages and exudates. And grade four, you'll see optic nerve edema. So this is a grade three. Um, you can see that the disc has nice, sharp, clear margins, but you do have exudates, cotton wool spots, arterial irregularities, blame hemorrhages. And then this is a grade four with a severe optic nerve edema. Obviously, this can be a lot of different things, so you want to um, keep hypertension on your differential, checking blood pressure in someone that comes in like this, but there's other things you'd want to consider, Bartonella, uh, mass lesions, anything like that. But, um, but, you know, if you see someone like this, you want to check the blood pressure in the clinic, and if it's high, obviously send them to the ER. <laughs> so. Um, Hypertension can also affect the choroid and the optic nerve. Um, you can see these l spots. These are these little um, kind of tan lobular lesions at the level of the choroid where there's non-perfusion. Initially, they're kind of tan, and then later they'll become hyperpigmented. And then the other thing that's kind of classically seen with hypertensive choroid changes are these Seagrass streaks. And this is just a uh, pigmentation that can follow um, the choroidal arteries, and this is associated more with acute malignant hypertension in young patients. You can also get serous RDs and focal or PE detachments. So check the blood pressure. If it's um, severely high, I'll send them to the ER. If it's, you know, more, if, I, if I'm not as worried, I'll send them to their primary care doctor pretty quickly within a week or so. But if it's, you know, 190, 200, they're going to the ER from my, from my clinic. <laughs> you don't want to send somebody home and they have a stroke or, you know, it's not good. <laughs> so moving on, sickle cell retinopathy. Um, this is kind of the classic test question. Not that we see it a lot here, but, um, but you will be tested on, on sickle cell retinopathy. Uh, you know, the sickle cell hemoglobin S is the valine substitution, and then hemoglobin C is a lysine substitution. Um, you get deformation of these red blood cells that then sickle, and then they thrombose and lead to vascular occlusions. Um, <clears throat> the most common um, Abnormality would be hemoglobin SS disease. That doesn't. That has more systemic complications and not as high um, a rate of ocular complications. The rate of proliferative retinopathy is highest in hemoglobin SC disease, and that I've seen tested for sure. So in the eye with sickle cell disease, you get sickling of these abnormal red blood cells, and that leads to thrombosis, and then you get peripheral occlusion and non-perfusion. That then leads to retinal neovascularization at the border of the perfused and non-perfused retina. Um, in non-proliferative uh, sickle cell disease, the classic kind of findings would be the salmon patch hemorrhage, and this is an arterial occlusion with downstream intraretinal hemorrhage, and then that salmon patch hemorrhage can kind of um, dehemoglobinize and then lead to these refractile deposits that you can see in the retina, and then the sunburst uh, lesion, this is from subretinal hemorrhage, and then you get RPE migration uh, into that. Sorry, the I don't have many pictures of sickle cell retinopathy, so I had to take it from books, and they didn't, they're not the best pictures, but you can kind of get the idea of it. Um, the other thing that you can see in sickle cell patients is angioid streaks, and this is from uh, occlusions at the choriocapillaris that can then lead to um, breaks in Brooks membranes. 
Um, and this occurs in about 6% of hemoglobin SS and AC patient, AS, AS patients. Any other, what do we normally see angioid streaks in here in uh, Utah? Uh, yeah, pseudoxanthin elasticum. Yeah, yeah, that's where, where I've seen it mo mostly here. Dr. Jacoby, why is it that there's more retinal manifestations with the SC than the SS? You know, I was looking into that the other day, and I don't think that anybody really knows the, the answer to that, I, at least that I've found. I don't know, I can look into it more, but I didn't see a reason for that, but that's a good question. So um, the staging, uh, stage one, you get peripheral occlusions and non-perfusion. Stage two, you get these anastomoses peripherally, and then stage three is when you start to see the C-fan, and then, um, Stage four is vitreous hemorrhage, and stage five is attractional detachment. So um, this is kind of that classic C-fan appearance, and these are in the peripheral retina, different than diabetic retinopathy, where you see it more in the posterior pole, but they, they get their, per, per, their proliferation peripherally. And this is um, kind of a white C-fan, and what's happened here is the C-fan is basically auto-infected, <coughs> and then it's left this kind of white C-fan. On angiogram, you can see these C fans just out in the periphery, um, just at the border of the non perfused and the perfused retina. And this patient's had some laser treatment. It looks like they need more. And this is just contrasting um, sickle cell from diabetic retinopathy. In diabetic retinopathy, we see the neovascular membranes along the arcades, along the optic nerve, but in sickle cell, the uh, the um, neovascularizations occurring in the in the periphery. Another thing you can see is these comma shaped um, blood vessels on the conjunctiva. So um, African American patients that come in with a hyphema, you want to screen for sickle cell disease that can be much more difficult to control the pressure and you want to consider an earlier anterior chamber washout. Um, you don't really want to do carbonic and hydrous inhibitors because that can dehydrate and worsen sickling. Um, I would do a baseline fluorescein angiogram in a patient with sickle cell disease to look for non-perfusion and, and proliferative disease. And you want to follow them pretty closely. The thing you want to be careful of is that laser treatment in these patients can often precipitate tears and detachments more so than what you want, than you would see in diabetic retinopathy. So often you start lasering and then they can end up detaching. So you want to be pretty careful. Um, people often will just do peripheral scatter laser to the non-perfused retina. Some authors advocate for um, actually lasering the feeder vessel of C-fans, but that's a little controversial because that does lead to kind of tears just right at the base of that C-fan. So most people do laser to the peripheral non-perfused retina. <clears throat> um, so when considering retina surgery for these patients, uh, you want to be careful with your surgical planning. Um, you would not do an encircling buckle because that buckle can lead to anterior segment ischemia and problems with uh, rubiosis and neovascular glaucoma. You want to be pretty careful um, with your cryopexy because of the risk of um, anterior segment ischemia from too much uh, cryopexy. Um, and you want to be really careful with your use of gases and epinephrine because you don't want to make anything worse by causing more sickling. And you have to um, monitor their pressure really closely in the post-operative period as well. What is do not remove the other? Oh, do, don't remove extraocular muscle. Like you wouldn't oh. detach any muscles when you're in the surgery because of the risk of ischemia from that. Not that we're commonly doing that, but sometimes you end up having to manipulate muscles, but you would not do that in a, in a sickle cell patient. So like I said, the uh, de detachment usually starts in that area of the ischemic retina that can be precipitated um, by laser. And the surgery can be really complicated. They have a high rate of complications. These are tough patients to, to take care of. Um, this is from your book, just to keep in mind your kind of differential diagnosis of peripheral neovascularization. I will not read that to you, but you can, <laughs> you can look at it. Yeah, Ali. So for your sickle cell patients, when you're doing RD uh, repairs, are you using like, like gas and ball or just not trying to read like, or air? 
So you could either use um, oil, would be a really good option in these patients. I think most people would do oil instead of the expansile gas formation. I mean, uh, to be honest, I don't have any sickle cell patients here in Utah. I think I had a few in Madison that required surgery. I saw more there than here, but here it's just not a really common, um, just not a common thing that we see. So it's, it's not as common to operate on, um, but I would probably use oil for a lot of these patients. So arterial macroaneurysms, um, the thing that's always tested on macroaneurysms is you just want to keep this in mind in your differential for um, something that can cause blood throughout all layers of the retina. It can cause subretinal, intraretinal, <coughs> preretinal blood, vitreous hemorrhage. So that's always um, kind of like the main OCAPS question on macroaneurysms. Typically you see it in the second order arterials and it can tra tra traverse the entire retinal thickness. <clears throat> These patients can get macular edema, macular fibrosis from the macroaneurysm. They can have vision loss from large preretinal, subretinal, and, um, and vitreous hemorrhages. They typically kind of spontaneously sclerose and um, thrombose on their own, so often they don't need treatment. Once they kind of bleed, they fibrose, and then that's kind of it. But um, Sometimes they can continue to leak, and then you might need to consider doing laser treatment. Sometimes with a really large hemorrhage, you would need to do surgery to go in and clear out the, the blood. We typically see this in kind of older women. Older women hypertension is a really high um, uh, comorbidity with these patients. And just this is kind of the typical fluorescein angiogram finding where you can see this dense blood. It's kind of hard to tell in the color picture. Maybe there's something right there, but you're not sure. And you do the fluorescein angiogram and you can see that dilation really light up. And then there's another macroaneurysm here that's not quite as big. Um, there are, are um, people that advocate um, using anti-VEGF agents for this patient. Um, that's not quite as common. Um, more commonly, you would see um, photocoagulation either around the macroaneurysm or even directly to the macroaneurysm to help fibrose it and involute it if it's quite leaky. Um, the risk of uh, kind of treating the macroaneurysm directly is it can lead to downstream uh, vascular occlusion. And then radiation retinopathy, um, Radiation retinopathy really looks a lot like diabetic retinopathy, and it's really managed a lot like diabetic retinopathy. Um, really keep it in mind patients that have had treatments for ocular melanomas, but then there's also patients who've had a fair amount of radiation for other, um, you know, other tumors to the head that can have radiation retinopathy. So if you can't quite explain why they look like a diabetic and they're not diabetic, you want to ask about radiation to the to the head. Um, it typically comes on a year and a half or so after external beam, but with plaque treatment, it can come on quite a bit earlier. Their treatments, um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of anti-VEGF agents are used nowadays. Triamcinolone, focal laser for macular edema, and then PRP. They can require vitrectomy for uh, neovascular complications and vitreous hemorrhages. And then. Um, Moving on to Valsalva retinopathy. Valsalva retinopathy um, can happen with any kind of strain. You can see it after food poisoning. You can see it after patients have had pneumonia and they've been coughing a lot and they just get these ruptures of these blood vessels. They can be really mild or more severe and they're kind of ruptures of these small capillaries in the macula. Often the blood is under the ILM. Usually it just resolves on its own, but sometimes it, it does require surgery. This is kind of a more mild uh, Valsalva retinopathy, and this would be one that you would really just watch, and that would get better. They would get quite a bit of visual return. This more severe um, hemorrhage, that would be one that if it's not clearing, you'd want to consider surgery for something like that. And then moving on to Percher's retinopathy. So Percher's retinopathy is um, due to 
usually it's an acute compression injury to the thorax of the chest. Uh, it was initially described in someone who fell out of a tree. <laughs> um, it's thought that it's kind of activating the complement cascade system and then we get leukocyte aggregation and then occlusion of um, arterioles that lead to this ischemia. They can also have optic nerve edema that leads to optic nerve atrophy. Uh, they can have irreversible vision loss. Sometimes it will get better, but they can have significant visual loss um, related to this. Um, this arrow is just pointing out um, perturflecken. And so um, this is this polygonal <coughs> shape. And it's hard to tell here, but it, the um, whitening doesn't actually reach the vessels. There's a clear area from the whitening to the vessel, and it's the occlusion of the precapillary arterioles there uh, from leukocyte. Yeah? With that last picture uh, that you had up there, how do you differentiate that from like uh, or Is it just based on History, yeah. So with perchers, they haven't had a direct blow to the eye, right? That's the main thing. Like perchers retinopathy, you have to have like that compression injury. <coughs> perchers like retinopathy, which I'm just going to cover. That's um, other causes that can look like this. Um, perchers like retinopathy is the fat embolism. Pancreatitis is the most common cause. You can also see it with autoimmune disease. But commotio, that's that direct trauma to the eye. And if patients have severe trauma, they might not know, right? Um, but perchers, you know, it can have some hemorrhages. Usually commotio, you would really severe commotio or scopoteria, <coughs> you're going to see more hemorrhages associated with it too. And perhaps with commotio, you might see like a choroidal rupture that could clue you in that there was a, a strong blow to the eye as well. You wouldn't see anything like that in, in perchers, obviously, because it's all happening at the level of the vessels with that, with the complement activation is the most, the biggest theory on what's happening with perchers. And then Tursan syndrome. Um, this is intracranial hemorrhage or even severe elevation in the intracranial pressure that can lead to these rupture um, of these of the retinal vessels. It can happen really quickly after an intracranial hemorrhage, almost within an hour of a, of a large subdural hemorrhage can you see intraocular hemorrhages. Often these patients are going to get better on their own and they have a pretty good prognosis for um, visual recovery. If they're um, not clearing, then you want to do surgery. This is kind of the classic double ring sign that you would see in Tursan. So this inner ring, the darker ring, is sub-ILM blood, and then this outer ring is sub-hyloid blood. And then Coates disease, kind of moving on to other retinal vascular diseases. <laughs> I just feel like there's so much to cover in this lecture that you don't get to talk about each as much as you might want. Um, but Coates disease um, typically presents in young men, um, young boys actually, and in infants. This is in your differential of leukocoria. They can have that white red reflex. You want to differentiate this from retinoblastoma. Um, ultrasound characteristics to differentiate from retinoblastoma would be Calcium, yeah, calcium, you would, if you get, they have calcium, it's not Coates disease, you want to be thinking about retinoblastoma. So this is retinal telangiectasia with these ectatic, ectatic arterioles, microaneurysms, and exudative uh, RDs. There's a broad differential, obviously, for leukocoria that you guys should know backwards and forwards. And then there's two different staging systems for Coates disease. They're pretty similar in terms of the different stages. I don't actually know why we need two different staging systems for Coates disease, but we have them. Um, stage four is total RD, and then stage five is when you get complications. Usually that's when they have uh, glaucoma issues and they get uh, an enucleation from a blind, painful eye. The treatment, kind of the standard treatment is laser photocoagulation to the uh, ectatic arterioles, 
They can off, we can often do cryotherapy as well. Um, these patients, if they get a total RD or even a pretty large RD, might end up needing a buckle with drainage and then a nucleation for those blind, painful kind of glaucomatous eyes, which are the really advanced stages that we try to avoid. Uh, there is some role for anti-VEGF agents in these um, patients as well. Um, if they present at a younger age, they usually have a worse prognosis than those present later on in life. Um, so macular telangiectasia, three types of macular telangiectasia. Um, Type 1 is um, unilateral in males, and it's really thought to be a variant of Coats' disease. So it's also called Lieber's Millerary aneurysms. You might have heard that as well. So some people actually just group Coats into type 1 macular telangiectasia. But, um, you know, the BCS separates the two. The real differentiating factor is Coats' disease is going to be in the young kids, the young boys, and then type 1 macular telangiectasia, you'll often see that in, in older patients. Type 2 is the most common. I feel like type 2 we talk about all the time. I think you guys <laughs> probably know type 2 MACTEL pretty well from fluorescenes or being in Bernstein's clinic with the studies that he's in. And then type 3 MACTEL is really rare. And I actually don't even know if I've ever seen type 3, but they have bilateral disease with retinal capillary obliteration. I can't even think, last night I was trying to think of a case off the top of my head, and I don't think I've ever seen it. So I don't know if you guys ever will. So type 1, so you can see the similarity um, with Coates disease. There's a lot of exudation. Um, and this exudation, though, is not quite as severe as we were seeing in the pictures of Coates disease, but it's in this typical in the temporal macula, uh, and they can have macular edema. Another picture of type 1 coats. Type 1B, so 1A is um, the congenital type. Type 1B, you often see this in kind of middle-aged males, and they'll just kind of have a couple little microaneurysms. They have excellent vision, really good visual prognosis. They're usually 20, 25. Often this is something that's not treated at all. And then type 2 MACTEL, um, this is the one that we talk about a lot. This is often bilateral. There's a genetic uh, component to it. You see RPE hyperplasia with these right angle venules. They can get crystalline deposits in the macula. Uh, Singerman spots are these glistening white dots you can see in the retina. And then um, advanced stages can get choroidal neovascular membranes. So the staging of MACTEL type 2, stage 1, normal exam, but you'll see fluorescein changes with temporal staining. And then stage 2, you start to see grain of the fovea and then telangiectetic vessels on the fluorescein. Stage 3, you get the dilated blunted uh, venule that's kind of diving at a right angle into the retina. And then stage four is when you start to get pigmentary plaques around those venules. And stage five is when you get neovascular disease. You can see OCT changes on all stages. Um, here's some autofluorescent changes with MACTEL that you guys should be pretty familiar with. This is the crystalline-like deposits that you can see with MACTEL. More fluorescence. That's, kind of, that's pretty classic. It'll be bilateral, temporal, leakage, late. And then the OCT changes are pretty um, specific for, for MACTEL, and you can see cavitations in the inner and outer retina. More MACTEL. And then type 3, this is the really rare bilateral uh, capillary occlusions. They can have abrupt loss of vision, and then later the telangiectetic vessels develop. Um, and like I said, this is just really uncommon. So um, type 1, the Coates type, often that's just treated with laser. You can also use anti-VEGFs. And then two, type 2, there's really no known treatment. Um, Dr. Bernstein's uh, getting involved actually in, in a study um, for different treatment options. Um, they don't respond well to laser. Um, people have tried a lot of different things for those retinal cavitations, but the, there's nothing that really treats those very well. The only treatment really is if they start to develop a choroidal neovascular membrane, then you would want to start anti-VEGF uh, treatments for that. All right.